Today we have the honor, and it is an honor, um, to have the man who served as city attorney of San Diego. Um, he's been a special friend of many of us. He left that part of public service to enter another part of public service and co-founded uh, the Alliance for Hope International. This is his, the book, and we have copies of it. As I said, he spoke to 2,000 people this week. I asked, asked him, how many uh, times a year now are you speaking? 165 times. And he just finished a session with the Federal Bureau of Investigation, over 1,000 agents on this book. And he's going to tell us about the Alliance, about the book, and we'll have a, a brief time before Dr. Warburg has to leave. Um, no, it's okay. Um, so welcome, please, the great Casey Gwynn. Well, thank you, friends, and thank you, George. It's nice to be with you uh, this morning. I'd like to start with a story, and it's a story about a boy who called himself Alex, and I met Alex in 2012. Alex was at our camp for children impacted by domestic violence here in San Diego. We were out at Camp Marston up by Julian, and as we were at the camp, we were day two, I had identified Alex. The camp had referred kids uh, to it from all over San Diego County, but Alex had been referred from the San Diego Family Justice Center, which we opened during my time as city attorney. His mom had come there as a victim of domestic violence, so I knew that Alex had trauma exposure in his life, and I could tell already at the age of 12 he ran hot. So I was close to him at camp, and on day two, we were in line for lunch going into the dining room at Camp Marston. I heard a boy behind me say, I want to play goalie. And I turned, we were in line for lunch, and I turned around, and a boy with a name tag that said Calvin was the one speaking. And I said, okay, Calvin, you can play goalie. And I thought, I don't know where the soccer game is, but I'm in. And then I turned, and the soccer field is right next door to the dining room. And some kids in the back of the line for lunch had started playing soccer. They had a ball, a couple kids playing offense, a couple kids playing defense. So I said, let's go over there, Calvin. I'll go with you. And he said, my name's not Calvin. My name's Alex. Okay, Alex, you can play goalie. So we walked over to the net. I said, Alex, do you play soccer? No. Do you know how to play goalie? Of course. So I said, will you stand in the net? And I organized two boys to play defense and a couple kids to kick offense. And Alex went in front of the net and stood like this the whole time. He never moved. He never moved. He never touched a ball. He never blocked a ball. The two kids playing defense kept trying to stop the ball, but they couldn't. He wouldn't even get the ball out of the net. They had to go get the ball out of the net. And then offense started again. This went on seven minutes. And then one of the nine-year-old boys that had been playing defense turned to Alex and said, you suck at goalie, which was a true statement. Alex actually did suck at goalie. And as soon as he said, you suck at goalie, Alex triggered and charged him. I will effing kill you and swung at him. And I caught Alex around the waist and we went into a restraint protocol because as soon as I caught Alex around the waist, his rage turned toward me. You're an effing dead man. You let go of me. You're abusing me. I'm going to kill you. And on and on it went. We got all the kids into the dining room. We have a rule of threes in our camping and mentoring program. No adult is ever alone with a child. Two adults stayed. Normally, our restraint protocol is to get a boy's arms to his sides and then sit him down on the ground. But there was a concrete wall next door, so I backed him up against the wall and I held him while he raged at me and I held him for 45 minutes against his will. All I said during those 45 minutes was, Alex, I know you're angry. Alex, I know you're mad. Alex, it's okay. Breathe with me, Alex. Breathe with me. Feel my breathing. Feel my breathing on your back. Breathe with me. <gasps> Breathe with me, Alex. And he kept raging. It took 45 minutes for him to begin to regulate. And during that time, I said nothing that would equal shame or blame in any way. 
until finally he started to come down. And as he started to come down and was beginning to breathe with me and relaxing, I wasn't really holding him anymore in a restraint protocol. I just had my arms around him. He wasn't fighting with me anymore. And so I said, Alex, in just a couple minutes, I'm going to let go of you. And you will have a choice to make. You can go find that boy and attack him. And you will go to jail today. We will call 911 and the San Diego County Sheriff's Department will come and you will be arrested and go to juvenile hall. Or you can attack me and you will also go to jail. <laughs> However, this afternoon we're going to go canoeing on the lake at Camp Marston. I'll teach you how to canoe. We'll go in a canoe together. I'll teach you how to balance a canoe, how to paddle a canoe. You and me, Alex, in a canoe. So it's your choice, canoeing or jail. And he said, let me think about it for a few oh. minutes. So I started to let go of him, and he said, don't let go of me yet. Ten minutes, we sat in silence, breathing together, while my arms were still around him, but I was not restraining him. After ten more minutes, Alex said, I'd like to go canoeing. I think I'd like canoeing. I've never been canoeing. I don't know what it's like to be in a canoe. I don't even know how to paddle a canoe. How do you balance a canoe? What if we fall in the water? Do we wear a life vest? How would I be safe? I'm not really a very good swimmer, but I want a canoe. And I said, Alex, that's a great choice. I'm really proud of you. And that afternoon, we went canoeing, Alex and I. We had to do a bit of a kind of debriefing with the nine-year-old because the nine-year-old was pretty sure Alex was going to kill him in his sleep that night. Uh, so he was very traumatized. But that afternoon, we did our debrief with the nine-year-old and Alex, and Alex apologized. We did not criminalize Alex Serrano that day. We did not send him to jail. We did not address his behavior as a crime. We addressed his behavior as a trauma reaction, a reaction to things that had happened in his life that were bad. We could have gone a different path because in America, we raise most of our criminals at home. Most of those that go to jail and prison in America grow up in homes with some mix of child abuse and domestic violence and drugs and alcohol. And if you put an overlay of poverty or historic oppression or racism on top of that, it's a magnifier that incarcerates large numbers of young men of color, people of color, girls and women of color. There are lots of force multipliers, if you will, of trauma in America. But we didn't do that with Alex. That was 2012. A year later, Alex came back to camp, except this time we were up on the Oregon border. Uh, and I got to take pictures of Alex whitewater rafting in class three, class four rapids on the Klamath River and took pictures of a smiling, laughing face that you would never imagine was the boy that was going to kill me one year earlier. Alex came to camp, in fact, every year after that in 14 and 15 and 16. And in 17, as a senior in high school, Alex became a counselor for Camp Hope America. Except now, Alex's name was not Alex anymore. Trauma kids like to change their name because they think if they change their name, they'll be a different person than the name they had when really bad things happened to them. So he decided he wanted to be Calvin again. So yes, we called him Calvin when he came to counsel for us. And seniors in high school in our nationally recognized camping program now get to counsel for seven to 11 year olds along with a team counselor who coaches them and so Calvin became a counselor. And then this last summer, Calvin counseled again. And I got to take pictures of him mentoring seven, eight, nine, ten year olds. Uh, Calvin is now at Southwestern College. Uh, Calvin didn't go to juvenile hall growing up, he didn't go to prison or jail. Calvin's in college where he belongs. And his dream is to become a psychologist so he can, quote, help other kids like me, unquote. And this last summer, I sat in his cabin circle when he described to the boys in his cabin for the first time out loud what it was like when I restrained him when he was 12 years old at that camp and what it felt like and why my restraint and my words to him were the first time he felt like anybody really believed in him in his life. Calvin's dad is an active duty army ranger to this very day. He has abused a series of women in his life. He abused Calvin. Calvin ended up then experiencing other men in his mother's home and was abused by them. And what comes out of that is rage. 
children exposed to trauma develop a low-grade fever at the beginning of that journey and they start to feel like this because they want their life to be like this and their life is not like this. And when that becomes endemic, that rage starts to build and that's what produces the next generation of rapists and batterers and men who beat and strangle and suffocate women in America. And so this journey for us has become how do we mitigate childhood trauma? How do we undo the propensities of kids growing up with violence and abuse so that they don't go to jail or prison or end up in mental health facilities? They go to college and they learn how to contextualize what's happened to them and change their lives and go a different direction from their parents. That's the journey of our work at Alliance for Hope International. I was very honored to serve for eight years as the city of Turning of San Diego. I left office in 2004, and in 2004, we had created the first Family Justice Center in America, 25 agencies under one roof. Uh, in 2004, Oprah Winfrey profiled our model on national television. I was on Oprah for two days at the end of my time as city attorney. Uh, the first, it was the actual Oprah show, and then she had what was called the after show. And in the after show, I got to be up on the couch uh, with Oprah, along with the other guests, and it's interactive with the audience. There were six times in the history of the Oprah Winfrey show that the after show became another national broadcast, and we were one of those. And I was then talking about how do we bring all the services together in communities to create a model where we can make a difference in the lives of trauma-exposed adults and children. Uh, after Oprah endorsed the Family Justice Center model, I was in the green room and she came in with her executive producer and they said, we just changed the rest of your life. And I laughed. I was married. I was the elected city attorney of San Diego. I had three kids. I didn't feel like my life had been changed. Chicago in January is not a life-changing experience. <laughs> you don't even want to be in Chicago in January. So I thanked her. I said, it's a real honor to be here. Thanks so much. And she kind of rolled her eyes, as did her executive producer, and they walked out. I wasn't unkind. I just thought, my life hasn't really changed quite yet. Within two years, though, we'd had site visitors from 77 countries come to the San Diego Family Justice Center. We just had a delegation six months ago come from Taiwan. And when I said to the woman leading the delegation, how did you hear about the San Diego Family Justice Center? She said, we saw you on Oprah 15 years ago. She didn't say 15 years ago, but I know that to be almost 15 and a half years ago. And then she said, you look younger on television. <laughs> To which I said, well, thank you. I was, after all, much younger. I got old in that journey. I became a grandpa on that journey. But that's the journey that we have been on. So after I left office, after being on Oprah, George Bush created a federal initiative called the President's Family Justice Center Initiative. And for two years, I worked for the Bush Justice Department. And we began to create these family justice centers. And then we began to ask the question, can we create camps like the camp we created here? Today, we have family justice centers in 40 states and 25 countries. This next summer, Camp Hope will operate in 20 states in the United States, and we've begun conversation to start our camping and mentoring model in Australia and New Zealand and Europe. All out of this journey that started in San Diego, but what has truly transformed our work from just let's get services together, let's get support together, <laughs> was that during these last five, six years, I met a man named Dr. Chan Hellman, who is the leading HOPE researcher in America. Chan is the director of the HOPE Research Center at the University of Oklahoma. And I learned when I met him in 2012 that you can measure hope in a human being and that you can teach hope to human beings. And that in fact, based on Chan's research and the research of Gallup, Gallup is now measuring hope in the American public. Gallup is now measuring hope in schools across America. The Gallup student poll is measuring hope in school students, fifth grade and up, five million kids a year in the United States. And what they're learning is that the level of hope in your life is more predictive of well-being than any other measurement. The level of hope in your life. So after I met Chan, we started measuring hope 
in all of our programs. We now measure hope in family justice centers. We now measure hope in the work that we're doing in Camp Hope America. We measure hope in a program called the Training Institute on Strangulation Prevention. We run the largest program in America to train doctors and nurses and cops and prosecutors and advocates in dealing with survivors who have been strangled by their intimate partners or by men in sexual assault cases. And we have begun to realize that when you are in a near-death experience in a violent, abusive relationship, hope literally gets sucked right out of your life. And now we've begun to realize it's not just about trauma survivors experiencing direct trauma. Police officers have one of the highest suicide rates in America because hope gets sucked out of their life every day in hearing and dealing with the vicarious trauma of others, in law enforcement officers going in situations day in and day out where they don't know if they're going to live or die. Then I read a book uh, by Dr. Jerome Groupman at Harvard uh, called The Anatomy of Hope as we begin to ask a, the question, should we be documenting this? How can we publish our research? And Jerome Groupman, who's an oncologist who's now teaching at Harvard Medical S School, said in 2003, Hope is what I see in cancer survivors that live that experience with more power than those who have lost hope, who are more likely to survive than those who do not survive. And so we begin to understand that this isn't just about trauma. It's about lots of things. And that piece in the last few years became very personal because two years ago, my daughter was diagnosed with the rarest form of lymphoma that exists on planet Earth. It's called gray zone lymphoma. She had Hodgkin's and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma at the same time. Carrie Ann's not a trauma kid, but Carrie Ann had to suddenly face the specter at the age of 28 that she was going to die because the survival rate from gray zone lymphoma is stunningly low. And we went through that journey as a family. And you want to talk about the battle for hope in your life. When we sat with a doctor at Scripps Hospital here named Mar and Xavier who said, the outcomes are not good, but we're going to do everything we can, Carrie Ann, to save your life. As I stand here two years later, my daughter's alive. My daughter's in remission. My daughter's five months pregnant. And I was there the day the doctor said, you may not be able to have children even if you live from this because we don't have time to harvest eggs. But by the grace of God, my daughter's alive. So in this journey of these last few years, we've started to figure out hope matters in all kinds of settings, in the school setting, in the trauma setting, in the cancer setting. And our new book, Hope Rising, which George mentioned, is that story. It's the story of how hope can be measured and how hope can be taught. Even as you sit here in five minutes, if I administered our hope scale right out of the book, I could tell you what your global, global dispositional hope score is. And hope goes like this in the life of a person. I'm a high hope individual, I have found. But during cancer, it went, it went ugly for me. I didn't take care of myself well for the first year of that journey with Carrie Ann. We were fighting for our lives. I do want to say that if it was not for Obamacare, for the Affordable Health Care Act, I believe my daughter would be dead today because she was on an HMO with one oncologist when she was diagnosed. And the oncologist, after we got the results from Stanford University, said, I've never heard of gray zone lymphoma, but let me do some reading. And we walked out of his office, and we had to go to Stanford and find the one doctor in Southern California at Scripps Hospital, whose name is Marin Xavier, who had a surviving gray zone lymphoma patient who had had a baby. And Marin treated our daughter. And that, that bill, without insurance, is pushing $2.7 million. We would have been bankrupted. I would have given everything. I would have given my life to save my daughter's life. But we didn't have the resources or the ability to do that. We went and got other health insurance. And we weren't asked about pre-existing conditions. And we were able to have Blue Shield of California step in and help save my daughter's life. So as I stand here today and share with you for just a few minutes, I just want to tell you that nothing is more significant in my life right now than this notion of the power of hope. There are spiritual components to hope, but the science of hope is not spiritual at its core. It doesn't have to be. It can be completely secular. So as we've begun to measure hope in our camping program, why did Alex go the pathway he did? 
we increased hope in his life. And here's the definition of hope. Hope is the belief that your future can be brighter than your past and that you have a role in making it so. You play a role in your own hope story. You write your own hope story. So when we're talking about hope, we're talking about goal setting, the ability to set goals. We're talking about what's called agency, which is the motivation to pursue goals. And we're talking about pathways thinking, which is the ability for somebody to figure out how to come around obstacles in order to get to your goal. And now you come back to Alex's story. So if hope is goals and the ability to get to goals, Alex wanted his family to be like this, hope-centered, hope-filled. He wanted his dad to be like this. But Alex didn't have any control over the choices his father made about who he was going to be. It's like me saying, I hope it's not going to rain today in San Diego. Is that really hope? Why is that not hope? I have no control and I have no ability to motivate myself be, to pursue that goal because it's out of my control. One, it's, and secondly, it's delusional because it probably is going to rain today in San Diego based on the storm that's coming. Alex wanted his dad to be like this. And in our research, we found the closest thing to hope is anger. And then when it becomes endemic, it's rage. When you want things to be like this in your life, you want to find a parking place today for this event, and you get frustrated because your goal is a parking space, and the parking lot is jammed, so you have anger, maybe just low-grade frustration perhaps, but when that becomes in an abusive home, a set of goals you can't reach, that produces rage. And then when you start, you still have a goal, but you can't get to your goals in life. When you start to lose your agency or your motivation in our hope continuum that we identify in our research, you get to despair. You start to despair. You still have goals, but now you're losing your motivation. And you don't necessarily have a pathway to get to them. And then the opposite of hope in our research is not hopelessness. The opposite of hope is apathy. And when you get to apathy, you get to a point where you think nothing can ever change. I can't get out of this. I can't fix this situation. There's nothing I can do about it. And apathy becomes the ultimate enemy of hope in the life of a human being. And that's the journey that we are seeing now in all of our research. Kids going into juvenile hall in this community and across America, uh, kids struggling in school, anger, rage, despair, apathy. When that teenager says, I don't give a about anything anymore. They have descended the hope continuum. And what we've begun to realize in all of our research now, and we've got about 70 studies going on, peer-reviewed academic studies on hope across the country, all led by the University of Oklahoma's Hope Research Center, we're finding that you can nurture hope back in human beings. And many of you that support nonprofit organizations, that support government-based programs where you see people come back from really difficult circumstances, they're hope givers. They actually are giving hope. They're not measuring it. They don't, they don't know that they're doing that, but that's what they're doing. And the notion that hope is something that you can measure and that you can teach is one that most people don't know. I didn't know it six years ago. I didn't know you could measure hope, and I didn't know that it was malleable. So before I uh, wrap up, let me share one story, because whenever I talk about hope, I give credit to the first researcher in America who has since passed away, died of colon cancer in 2006. His name was Rick Snyder. Rick Snyder was at the University of Kansas. He was the first positive psychology researcher in America to say, I think you can validate a scale that measures hope. And he did it in the late 1990s. And Rick then went on Good Morning America for the first time hope was talked about in public. Uh, one chapter of the book uh, gives credit to Rick Snyder. Let me share it with you. Rick Snyder, the first hope scientist, appeared on Good Morning America in 2000 to conduct a live experiment showing and measuring hope in action. He brought with him a cold presser tank. A cold presser tank uses ice water to assess pain tolerance. Rick knew a lot about pain tolerance. He suffered from chronic pain for many years in his life. Rick challenged Charlie Gibson, the host of Good Morning America, the medical expert Tim Johnson, and Tony Perkins, the meteorologist, to submerge their right fists into the cold water tank for as long as they could stand it. Tony Perkins pulled out first, shaking his hand hard, trying to get feeling in it again. Charlie Gibson and Tim Johnson became extremely competitive and vowed to keep their arms submerged throughout the entire nationally televised segment. 
Tim Johnson finally <clears throat> gave up just as the segment ended and they went to a commercial break. Charlie Gibson, wanting to prove something to everyone, held on into the break, into the break with his hand in the tank. When they came back from the commercials, Charlie Gibson was declared the winner, but asked Rick Snyder, what does this contest have to do with hope? Rick then told them that the research on hope had found that hopeful people consistently tolerate more pain than their less hopeful counterparts. Then Rick revealed to the entire national audience of Good Morning America that before the segment, Charlie, Tim, and Tony had taken a standardized hope test and their hope scores would accurately predict the order in which each one would call it quits from the cold presser tank. He opened the envelope and disclosed their results. Charlie had the highest hope score, Tim had the second highest hope score, and Tony, the weatherman with no control over the weather, had the lowest <laughs> hope score of the three men. So after Rick began to talk about this, uh, the University of Kansas uh, partnered with Gallup in the mid-2005-6-7 uh, area uh, time frame uh, to start looking at how to measure hope. And Gallup then created what's called the Gallup Student Poll. In 2006, the, the year that Rick died, Dr. Chan Hellman at OU kind of took over some of the mantle of Rick's work and started measuring hope in cancer survivors, in Parkinson's patients, in Alzheimer's patients, in dementia patients, uh, in trauma survivors, in adults and children, and began to say, hope matters more than anything else in life. And we've got to be about giving hope. It's very interesting, during the writing of the book, I started reading a lot of um, work that Mother Teresa had put into print during her amazing life. And Mother Teresa was asked in an interview about two years before she died, what do you think is the calling of human beings? And she said, to give hope, always hope. And then she lived it out. She was a hope giver. So that, that statement, as Brene Brown has often said, uh, assumes something. It assumes that you have hope to give because you cannot give what you do not have. So low hope teachers don't do as well as high hope teachers. Low hope law enforcement officers don't do as well as, as high hope law enforcement officers. Kids in school with low hope don't do as well. In fact, we found in the, in the research that we've accumulated, 2,000 studies we looked at around hope in the publishing of Hope Rising. We found this, if you take two children with the same IQ and one child has a 10% higher hope score than the other child, this child will get A's when this child gets B's. If you take two employees, same skill sets, same IQ, and one employee has a 10% higher hope score, this employee will be able to do in seven hours what it takes this employee to do in eight hours. And Gallup just most recently published that if you take children that are headed to college and compare their hope scores with their SAT scores, their hope score is more predictive of college success than their SAT score. So we need to be about the business of hope. And I will tell you the piece that's been most personal to me in the writing of Hope Rising with Chan is that we begin both to process our own trauma in our lives. And we have in the book contrasted hope with how hope gets robbed in human beings. And hope is something that gets robbed in children very, very young. So Chan's story is in the book. Chan is a tenured professor at the University of Oklahoma, and he grew up in a home with a drug dealer father and a drug and alcohol addicted mother and put a gun in his mouth when he was 12 years old and debated whether to live or die. He tells the story in the book. And once Chan told his story, I decided I had to tell my story. I grew up uh, in a Christian home in Northern California. My dad was the president of Christian Camping International. My dad was the director of one of the largest Christian conference centers in the Western United States. Uh, but I didn't really tell my story over the years. I grew up in a home with violence and abuse too. And my dad had a lot of good things about him. He was an amazing man, but my dad also abused his children to the point that as a prosecutor, I sent people to prison for things my dad did to me in the name of discipline. 
And as Chan and I began to process our own stories, we started looking at what's called the Adverse Childhood Experience Study, uh, led by Dr. Vincent Felitti, who was the head of preventative medicine for Kaiser here in San Diego, that was the first major researcher in America just 15 years ago to start asking, when kids do get robbed of hope, when trauma happens in their lives, what happens over time? And Dr. Felitti's research has now been taken all over the country by the Center for Disease Control. If you've ever heard of the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study, it now creates a score between zero and 10 for the amount of childhood trauma that somebody goes through. And the higher that score goes, the worse the outcomes are in people's lives. So for example, if you're a six on the ACE scale measuring bad things, traumatic things that happened to you before you're 18, on average, you die 20 years younger than somebody who's a zero on the ACE scale. If you're a six on the ACE scale, the likelihood of using opioids or injecting heroin into your body as an adult goes up 4,600%. The highest correlation that an epidemiologist will see in their entire careers, according to Rob Onda at the CDC. So as we begin to connect these things, childhood trauma, the significance of hope, we realized, one, we got to help trauma survivors understand what may have happened to them as children and how that can rob them of hope. And then we got to figure out how to increase hope in their lives. And so that's the work of uh, Alliance for Hope International as we continue to pursue this vision of how do you increase hope in human beings. If you want to change the life of those growing up and being impacted by trauma, you don't wait until you have the debate about criminal justice reform and say we've got to get everybody out of prison because prison doesn't solve anything, which is true. You ask the question, how do we restore hope to the lives of 10-year-olds so they never have to go to prison to begin with? How do we keep people out of prison and jail and juvenile hall? Not how do we let everybody out of prison when they're 35 or 40 or 50 years old. Prison is not a place where you find hope in America. Juvenile hall is not a place where you find hope in America. You find hope by gathering around you people that believe in you and then building agency, which is that motivation to pursue goals and then having real pathways to get to your goals. And I will tell you, this is not a partisan concept. So yes, George Bush helped us start family justice centers in America. And then we did more work with Joe Biden and with Barack Obama and with Attorney General Eric Holder than we ever did with the Bush administration. Uh, and yes, now we are working with those in the trenches of the Justice Department, even in the current administration, because there's lots of good people in the federal government that care about this issue. And I will tell you that my interactions during the Obama years with Eric Holder were some of the most significant times in my entire life. Eric Holder was one of the most transformational attorney generals in the last 30 years. And he implemented something called the Defending Childhood Initiative that is still alive in the Justice Department today where we're asking the question, how do you restore hope to the lives of trauma-exposed kids so that we can keep them out of jail and prison and keep them out of altercations with law enforcement, keep them out of being the perpetrators of the Me Too world, keep them out of being the rapists and the stranglers and the abusers and the cop killers of America because of their rage. And that's the work that we are now integrating to this very day uh, in the work that we do. So let me stop there. Um, it's been an amazing journey for us to be able to process this, not just personally, but professionally. I score a five on the ACE scale. My wife scores a zero on the ACE scale. It's a terrible thing to say my wife is a zero. <laughs> but what it means is that she, did, she grew up in a healthy, functional home without violence or abuse. I grew up in a different kind of home, so I've had to navigate some of those issues in my life and my career. But she needed to understand it because she worked as a teacher for 20 years. And she now wishes she'd known at the beginning of her career what she knows now about hope and trauma and how we can restore it. Uh, and I just recently uh, had to watch the journey. First, my dad died of a heart attack. And I watched my dad, my bipolar father, with a ton of trauma impacts from his childhood who never dealt with them, who could never talk about them, struggle with that regret at the end of his life. 
And then I watched my mom go through Parkinson's and struggle with all of those challenges. And both their stories are in the book because it's time for us to be honest about the impacts of trauma, violence, and abuse, even in our own lives. And it's time for us to be honest about how we can change that ending by increasing hope in the lives of human beings. So thank you, George, for letting me share today and blessings on all of you. Um, thank you. I had no idea. Dr. Warburg, did you want to leave or ask a question? Can I ask a quick question? <coughs> sure. Leave? Sure. Can you breath, but <coughs> my question about is with, with a kid like Alex who has that one week experience, is there then follow up over the year? And what is that follow up? So at the beginning of camp, when Alex was first coming, yeah. Chan Hellman came in and said, We should measure hope in Camp Hope. You, after all, call it Camp Hope. Uh, so are you increasing? I said, I'm sure we are. Kids are changing. The, their lives are changing. So we measured it in 2013 statewide. We by then had seven communities bringing kids to camp uh, up on the Oregon border. That's why we're on the Oregon border. And we measured it 30 days before camp, the last day of camp, and 30 days after camp. And hope went like this. So we knew we were moving it, but we couldn't sustain it. Right. So then we created a year-round mentoring program, not a one-on-one -on -one mentoring model, because one-on-one -on -one mentoring models are not sustainable. The average length of a mentor, for example, in Big Brothers Big Sisters is one year and two months. So it's powerful, but it doesn't last. So we created a group mentoring model so all those kids do activities all year long together. And then when we measured hope, it went up, and then hope stayed up throughout the course of the year. And the higher hope goes in Alex's life, the more predictive it is of outcomes. Doesn't mean everything is solved. Alex still has been dealing with his father over those years, who is a rage-filled human being. And the reason I get to tell Alex's story is because he's given me permission to tell it, and he wants it told. In fact, Hope Rising has about 40 stories of adults and children who are using their real names. The, their real names are in the book. They all gave permission to say, we want you to use our real name. But yes, you've got to have think, kids need things to look forward to all year long. If they don't have a pathway forward, all they focus on is Friday night. That's how they join a gang. That's how they get drunk on Saturday night with their friends is they can't see the future because hope is future orientation. When you're looking backwards, it's about trauma. And when you're looking forward, it's about hope. Um, so you, did you want a book? She got one. Oh, all right. Yeah. Um, Thank you, Robin. Thank you. Very much. Thank so you. as you were talking, what came to my mind is I have to get this book and send it to my ex-husband, who is a retired psychiatrist. But what comes to my mind is <clears throat> in his practice, he would have a family where there were biological children all doing extremely well, then an adopted child who was kind of a monster. And, you know, looking at it, same environment, but yet different outcome. And it seems that that's such an interesting concept that would be worthy of teaching mental health professionals. So the question is, are you all doing that? Yes, and we talk about it at length in the book. So it's about brain development. The Adverse Childhood Experiences Study is about brain development. Things happen in utero. Things happen in the first 12 weeks of life. Things happen in the first five years of life that shape the brain of a human being. And we do a lot of work with neurologists that do live brain scans now of children. We're doing less than we used to do. But if you take a, a live brain scan of a severely traumatized child at the age of three, their brain will look like this. And if you take the brain of a healthy child at three, their brain will look like this. You can't see that. So you expect these two children to act the same. They're in the same home. But you don't know what the epigenetics are of that child, what has happened in the transmission of trauma into that child's brain and body. Uh, when they were first developing, how the vagus nerve is operating in the human body that runs the length of our body that connects to how we, how we think, how we operate, how we act. So that's the connection here. Uh, Dr. Bruce Perry is one of the leading pediatric neurologists in America, and he has spoken at some of our events in recent years. And he recently said this at a conference that he and I were both speaking at. And he know, he's doing a lot of work about how to create brain development, how to increase brain function in trauma exposed kids. He said, um, if the journey to understand the human brain is 100 miles, we have traveled two inches. Mm -hmm. 
whoops, excuse me. So the, the point of that is that we don't know yet what we don't know. But what we do know is that trauma-exposed kids need profound interventions, positive interventions that the brain is very elastic. You know, Mark Twain once said, you know, children should be put in a barrel at seven when they misbehave. And then at 13, if they haven't changed, you should plug the hole in the barrel that you, <laughs> that you drilled for them. And so we have the sense that if you don't get them at, at you know, three, three years, five years, seven years, it's over by the time they're 13. That's just plain a lie now in all of our new brain research. It's very clear that we can change the brains of human beings. Into their 30s, the plasticity of the human brain is really quite fascinating. And we're seeing it in the stroke work, we're seeing it in traumatic brain injury work, in concussion work. Haven't figured out the chronic traumatic encephalopathy piece with football players. Once they've suffered that damage and get CTE, it's clearly degenerative and there is really no treatments known for the tau proteins destruction in the human brain but we're sure working on it and we're sure beginning to ask the question can you heal the human brain or create new neural pathways uh, especially for trauma exposed adults and children and the answer is yes in a lot of situations i want to ask a question about about football players national football league players mm -hmm. because i was thinking today that the last conversation <clears throat> i had with george plimpton um, we spoke that afternoon, he passed away that night. But he told me he had just come back from Detroit mm -hmm. where they had a big ceremony uh, honoring him, Paper Lion. They somehow found the jersey that he had worn mm -hmm. with the number zero and <coughs> presented it to him. But what has lingered in my mind was that he was at a dinner with all of the people that he had played with. And he said how um, concerning it was to him to find that so many of them uh, were in the early, if not advanced stages of dementia. Mm -hmm. And I hadn't seen or heard anything about this issue until that conversation with George. And then, as we know, um, we read about it every day. So in everything that you're doing, are you suggesting there is an element of hope for those players? I think there is. I, th I think there is. And sometimes it's too late. I have a chapter in the book uh, that includes a section that says sometimes it's too late for hope. You get a rage-filled man who descends that continuum, and, and sometimes rage goes with you as you lose hope in your life. You end up with a rage-filled man who's apathetic, and that puts him on the 32nd floor of the Mandalay Bay Hotel in Las Vegas, uh, and he becomes a mass shooter at a country western concert. It's too late for hope uh, in that situation. But if you go to the front end of this football journey, I think we're learning a lot about it. For starters, it's not just about football players. So chronic traumatic encephalopathy has been around since the 1920s. It was first diagnosed in boxers. And boxers were diagnosed, and we had a phrase for boxers. What was it? They were punch drunk. Punch drunk was a description of a boxer who had chronic traumatic encephalopathy, this degenerative condition, because the human brain is attached to nothing inside the skull. It was never intended to be bounced around and slammed over and over and over again. So boxers we have research on. We now have research on MMA fighters being diagnosed with CTE. We have soccer players. We have veterans being diagnosed with CTE. Uh, we have football players. But I believe the largest group of people in America suffering from CTE are not getting diagnosed, and it's actually battered women. So we're talking, uh, Johns Hopkins' new work, they just ordered 100 copies of the book to give to their whole uh, medical psychology team. They are interested in battered women because you've got millions of women being strangled, concussed, hit in the head, uh, and then suffering these injuries that are never being diagnosed. So you got a couple thousand football players that have been diagnosed over the course of all the research in this that are at risk. You've got 112 cases in the last big NFL study where 111 out of 112 had CTE. But I think the hope piece is how do we come in front of that? Whether you can fix football and make it safe for the human brain, I question that. But 
you can at least provide the information so people can have informed choices about what they're going to do with their mm -hmm. lives. Mm -hmm. uh, they're banning headers in soccer now in kids' youth soccer leagues all over America because soccer players have been diagnosed in their professional careers now with CTE, and they believe it's about headers. It's about using your head, uh, and that's a concussive impact. Every time they head a ball, that's a concussive impact. So I think the hope piece for me in all of this is we're learning it, and we're able to provide the information. And yes, if you get to it early enough, uh, you can, one, stop the ongoing concussive events. Uh, and two, you can begin to talk about this very early on with kids. Here's the tricky piece. Rage-filled child trauma kids make great NFL football players. You grow up with rage in your life and you're driven and passionate and fiery and you can let it all out on the football field. They might become good police officers or Marines or Navy SEALs. So we, if we begin to understand this, we've got to deal with that trauma piece before they go off to Afghanistan or Iraq because what's happening in the military research is we're finding that a lot of these suicides that are happening in the military every day, those individuals had childhood trauma exposure long before they went to Iraq or Afghanistan. And it becomes a cumulative impact, the childhood trauma stuff, then the military exposure that produces the complex PTSD. So I think for all of this, this is hope-centered because we're beginning to ask, how do you deal with that trauma first so that the impact of the early trauma isn't as significant later? And how do you provide information to people to make real choices with their kids about what sports they should be involved in? Uh, yeah, I just met with the lead counsel for the NFL on domestic violence, and we had a fascinating conversation. She's the lead administrative prosecutor for the NFL, and she said, this is really getting complicated because we're figuring out that a lot of these problems with child abuse and domestic violence in the NFL go all the way back to the childhood of the football player. So when Adrian Peterson says, I'm the man I am today because of what my father did to me when I was a child, he's actually telling the truth. He is the man that he is today, multiple, you know, having multiple women in his life, fathering children with at least four different women, beating his kids, including using a strap and a whip with them. Still, today, after all that he's gone through with the NFL and public exposure, he is the man he is today because of what happened to him as a child. He just sees it a little differently than the rest of us see it as far as what that means. But it at least forms the basis for a conversation. So I want to uh, say... <laughs> I'm not given to understatement, um, you already knew that, but I don't think that I can overstate how important this has been. So I'm, gonna, I'm not going to ask you to do this. I'm going to charge you to do this. When you go home, if you're on Facebook, I want you to reference this, and I want you to encourage your Facebook friends as I encourage you to do with emails, that tomorrow afternoon, I'm sure Chris will have this up, go to YouTube, write in City Club Presents, and listen to Casey. Encourage your friends and your family members to do that. And though we're small in number, we can exponentially grow this incredibly important uh, message. And if you want a copy, we'll, we didn't know we would have books, but we'll work something out so that Casey gets reimbursed for the books. So let's, let, me, let me just say to Thanks, you, George. thank you. Thank you. Um, I had really some idea, but nothing even remotely close. It's incredibly impressive what you've done and what you're doing, and it's in all of our interests that you keep it thank up. You. Thank, thank you. you Blessings so on you, my friend. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. Uh, I have a question. Uh, first yeah. of all, thank you for your work. Um, and the question oh, is, uh, how do you measure your impact? Like, you have, you, you're able to measure impact on an individual level. You can see, let's say, the person is actually becomes more hopeful or less hopeful. Mm -hmm. But how does this impact society? I'm sure you're a <coughs> politician. Is a so we're measuring a whole host of, of outcomes related to hope scores. So. We, we are now uh, tracking hope scores of kids in our, we have a local program and then we have 
national program. So in our local program, Verizon has been helping us do a year-round program, and we're doing it with kids in San Diego and Imperial County. So our, our, we're, we're in the third year of a longitudinal study of what happening, what's happening to our kids. High trauma scores, so the average ACE score of our kids in San Diego and Imperial is a six. Uh, that's a very high ACE score. Um, and so we're tracking those kids longitudinally, school performance, uh, interest in college, a uh, vocational school interest. Um, we are at the present time, year three, we have a 100% college enrollment rate of every child in our, in our year round program. They're not going to jail or juvenile hall, they're going to college. And almost every one of them is a first generation college student. So about a third of our kids are undocumented immigrant children. They're dreamer kids. So about a third of our kids are dreamer kids that are navigating their way right now through very scary times in the United States of America for children who are in this country, who are brought here as very young children uh, illegally, uh, but they didn't get to make those choices, and now they're here and they're navigating. So they've got a ton of trauma from just the fear of all that, and then they've got sexual assault, domestic violence, child abuse they've experienced as well. But we're, we're tracking those outcomes longitudinally. So that's my goal. My goal is to keep tracking that, and we're, uh, Verizon has invested about $3 million with us so far to now replicate the model across the country. So we have family justice centers all over the country. For example, in New York City, we have one in every borough of New York City. Michael Bloomberg implemented that whole framework. de Blasio has supported it, but Michael Bloomberg is the one that actually made it happen almost 10 years ago. So kids go to those family justice centers for help, and then they go to camp in New York as part of our Camp Hope America program in New York. So, and then they come back and do activities all year long. So the goal is not just take an abused child uh, to camp and then put them back in a violent home. That's the surest way to rob a child of hope I can possibly imagine. The goal is to get them out of the violent situation, then focus on how to increase hope in their life. And I'm a big fan of outcomes. We sh we, we're tracking our outcomes because nobody should be giving us money and nobody should be supporting this if it doesn't work. Uh, I'm tired of the days where nonprofits say you should just give us money because we're helping people. I think we should have to prove our outcomes. And uh, our research about all of our programs is in the book and lots of other programs now that are doing the same thing uh, where they're measuring hope and predicting outcomes from it. I didn't, I didn't plan on making a comment, but I'm going to do that. Um, uh, we had a child beating mother, uh, and when I left at 17, I never saw her again. Mm -hmm. uh, it, when police were called by neighbors, this is my point, um, she would put on a very charming face, and as soon as the police were gone, uh, tape across the mouth, mm. and, and then it went on for longer. Mm. Uh, I, what the hope for me is, and I've been following this subject for all my life, as you can imagine, mm. uh, is that the hope is that police respond now. Authorities respond now. The kid is not left there alone forever. Yeah. Making yeah. their own hope. I had, in my case, models in the neighborhood or whatever and just chose to... We have we have a vision that's starting to emerge in San Diego for a collaborative campus where we bring the Chadwick Center for Children and Families, which is the Child Advocacy Center here. We bring the San Diego Family Justice Center. We bring the Rape Crisis Center that's run by an organization called Center for Community Solutions, and we co-locate all of them together on a campus. And then we have satellite facilities in North County, East County, and South Bay. Summer Stephan, the the new DA, and Mara Elliott, the new city attorney, have both endorsed that framework. And we're now beginning to ask, what can that look like? And it, once you can get that framework, I mean, we have campuses like this all over the country now. We just built a $25 million campus in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And we have 55 law enforcement officers there living with doctors, nurses, advocates, prosecutors, uh, faith-based support services, social services, mental health services on the campus. It's called the Sojourner Truth Family Peace Center. And we planned it in a bipartisan way. We got $10 million from Scott Walker, and we got money from the city of Milwaukee, which is a progressive, liberal, democratic city, and they hate each other. The mayor of Milwaukee and Scott Walker are not friends, but they came together around the focus of childhood trauma and how to mitigate these long-term outcomes. Because if you find hope, if you find hope in that journey, you over, um, lots of people have bad things happen to them and they overcome it, but those that don't have mitigation, and they're called. So it is. more of this is happening, which is good. 
which it's a good job that you're doing, but that is a, a key that they're, yeah. they're, they're we have a long ways to go. This is going on, and nobody will help because there there's no way out. Yeah. And you get in, you can be sued by your family yeah. uh, who's doing the damage, uh, and so people are less likely to. And if you can't count on the authorities that you run into, the teachers, the police who are called, then the, then you're hopeless. Yeah, I agree. I agree. We've got if a lot of work to do. Want a copy? We'll work something out. So. Yeah, I've the the books are fifteen dollars. All the money goes to Camp Hope America. So if you're interested you can, in one. What you can Thank you all. Thanks for letting me share with you. Thank you. Thank you very much.